Now I'll turn to the last case on this morning's docket. It's case number 107752 in the matter of Megan Lee Harrington. Good morning and may it please the court. The Office of the Disciplinary Administrator appears by Kimberly Knoll, Deputy Disciplinary Administrator. I would ask for four minutes for rebuttal time. Four minutes is granted. Thank you. As the court is aware, this case comes to us as a result of a serious accident. The respondent was on K-10, crossed the median, um, and struck another vehicle almost head on. It was, it was a little off center. Um, at the time of the accident, there was a blood draw done pursuant to a search warrant. Her blood alcohol content was 0.16, and she had also ingested cocaine. Um, she ended up <clears throat> pleading guilty to three misdemeanors. She was given three years of probation. One of the terms was to have an interlock device that is scheduled to terminate at the end of this month. Um, that was only for two years. Uh, she received 45 days in jail and was in house arrest for 60 days. Following about a year of treatment and attending AA meetings and working with the Kansas Lawyers Assistance Program, she terminated um, all of those programs. <clears throat> At the hearing, it was indicated that she had had no positive tests um, as part of her probation. And she has produced an affidavit relating to her plan of probation um, that references other material that was not, my understanding, was not produced to the court it's my understanding that she is going to request that to be made part of the record, and I don't have an objection to it. I think it has some useful information that the court needs to have in order to make a, a review of what the appropriate discipline is. Because she um, stipulated to 8.4b, we're not really here to talk about whether or not there was a rule violation um, that was found. The question is, what is the appropriate disposition and discipline? The hearing panel that had the opportunity to observe her demeanor, to hear her words, and at the end of the final hearing report, they found that she had knowingly caused actual injury to an individual, that she had failed to acknowledge the wrongful conduct, nature of her conduct, and her testimony regarding her cocaine use was casual and it was disturbing to the panel. Council, I I want to focus your attention on paragraph 24 of the hearing panel report, which um, says during the hearing the respondent testified that she doesn't have an alcohol problem. And then she, it says number two, and this is the one I want to focus on. She acknowledged the conclusions of the professionals that she may have an alcohol problem. And I wanted to know what that was about. Who Conclusions of what professional? The um, uh, challenges, the... Um I want to know about the conclusions, not the fact that she may or may not challenge them. I'm it, more interested in who these professionals are. No, no, are. That, that, that was the name of the place was Challenges. It was her, it was her treatment therapist. And what she wrote, she, right after the accident, on the advice of counsel, and I think probably because she figured out that this was, and I don't want to put thoughts in her head, but this was a serious accident, she went and started seeking um, treatment. And the plea process took some time. And so she had actually already completed her therapy sessions by the time she pled and was sentenced. And it was suggested that she need to go back and get um, another um, update from the provider that she had gone to. And she did obtain that. And what that provider, um, I believe, wrote was that, let's see. The, let's see, a letter was dated January 12, 2011. The council reported that respondent does not believe she's an alcoholic. And then at the hearing, a record uh, page 2 at 68, she testified that I, this is a respondent, I definitely tend towards substance abuse. I know that I abuse substances. I don't think there's any question about that. One question that my counselor and I spoke at length and neither she or I could say for sure was whether you know I was an alcoholic or was dependent upon substances. 
And part of the additional information that I believe she's going to submit to you, she had a, another evaluation in April of this year um, with professional services over in Lawrence pursuant to her KLAP monitoring conduct. And there is specific test results in that subsequent report that, that addresses that specific issue. Have I answered your question? So the hearing, but that was after the hearing panel report. So the hearing Correct. panel's conclusion is, I'm focused on the plural of professionals. And I want to know how many different professionals thought she, she had, may have an alcohol problem. She had an ASAP eval, which is, is the court-ordered kind of um, screen for probation. And I honestly never saw a result from that. And then she also had... Okay, so we take that off the table. So private counseling that she had a, a, an individual that wrote a report and wrote an, an update as part of her criminal sentencing. So we have a professional, not professional. I'm just trying to figure out if we got six people lined up that says she has an alcohol problem or if we have one person who's... I believe it's singular. Well, can, Ms. Noel, can I ask you, on that same track, based on what you just represented, the, the singular evaluation was that this was based on, she didn't really deny that she'd had, that she'd abused alcohol. She simply indicated that neither she nor her therapist could determine whether she was an alcoholic or qualified as dependent upon alcohol she didn't really did she really give any conflicting testimony about whether she was or wasn't whether she did or didn't have an alcohol problem which is what the panel found right i think part of it was to have been in the room and to be able to see the image in in the reference that she was she was giving off to the panel um, her discussion about going to Barley's and there was cocaine there and it was offered to her and that's what all of her friends did. Um, her discussion about being on diversion for minor in possession, um, that that's what her friends did and you just went and did a couple of hours of classes. And so I think after hearing all of that and then hearing um, that she didn't necessarily like Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, she didn't necessarily think that she needed more treatment. Um, I, I think that all kind of played in to, to their conclusion because um, it was my impression that there was significant attempt to mitigate the nature of the problem throughout. Mitigate um, or minimize? Both. Okay. So what's your recommendation? My recommendation was for a two-year suspension, and part of that was, was based upon um, the Fromm case, and part of it was based upon um, the, the amount of time that substances have been a part of this young lady's life. Um, she requested probation. At the panel found that it wasn't in place, it wasn't workable, it wasn't sufficiently detailed. She has submitted that same plan to this court. Um, I think in part of what she'll talk about is what she has done uh, in the interim. Um, I would ask that you adopt the panel's findings um, and that you reject her request for probation and that you do impose a sentence. What I specifically asked for was um, not more than two years. Those, those were my exact words. And require her to undergo a reinstatement hearing pursuant to 219. As we stand here, as we, as, as we come here today, what's the threat to the public from letting her be able to practice law under supervision? Based upon her updated, I don't believe that she has grasped that she has a significant problem. Um, the writer uh, expressed that she has a, a moderate probability of reoffending. She does not want to necessarily participate in the 12-step Alcoholic Anonymous program, which the writer indicated that she needed not just solo therapy, but she needs that peer support. Um, she has some significant stressors uh, with her family that is is creating some some strife. Um, the interlock goes off on October 29th. 
um, she had demonstrated an ability to not drink for periods of time. Um, she got academically dismissed evidently from Kansas State University after a freshman year um, due to her drinking. Then she got it back together. She made it through law school and then started having having problems. And so I, I, I guess I don't technically know what the definition of an alcoholic is, but all of the reports that I've seen are clear that she has a substance dependence problem that has not necessarily been fully addressed. If the threat to the public is that she doesn't grasp her problem yet, what's a period of suspension do? The, the three months that the panel recommended or something less than two years, which is what you're arguing for? What's that add to the mix here? Well, in the, in the updated um, program, she indicated that one of the motivators for not engaging in illegal substances is the consequences that could befall her. Um, and, and I think that this act, you know, it, she was originally charged out with a felony. It went up to a level five aggravated battery because the um, victim reported that his spleen was bleeding. And then she ended up getting convicted of misdemeanors. If she had been convicted of a felony, she first of all would have already been suspended under our rules. Um, and I think our rules are designed to not look at necessarily, you know, to after this last argument, to look at a grid, but to look at the underlying consequences. And, and her actions and her, and her behaviors did not change because she only got convicted of a misdemeanor. The activity is still there. Um, and so, you know, if we have Mr. Fromm that was suspended um, for similar conduct, he was drunk in a car, he hit some people, um, they got hurt, he got convicted of a felony, but the, the decision to drive and the decision to ingest cocaine uh, is not mitigated by the outcome of the criminal case. Any more questions of counsel? One quick one, Keith, if I might. As a practical matter, three months with a condition of a 219 reinstatement hearing is in effect how long? Can you get back in practice in a year if you have a three-month suspension and then you have to petition for reinstatement and have a hearing and, you know, adding are, are, you, are, you, are you asking as a practical manager, yeah, Justice right, Thompson? Right. Um, yes, I, I believe that that would, if everything is, is together and everything is, is appropriate. And you have to understand, at the time I made this recommendation also, um, she had stopped treatment. Um, she has, and you will get, I'm assuming, um, that she is going back to AA. She started that in June. Um, she's doing some other things. She's I'm back just trying Taylor. to talk about the practical. Yes. We say three months suspension, but in effect, there will be an inability to practice law for probably at least a year by the time she gets through the reinstatement um, and has the order to allow her to practice I, as a practical matter. I would say it's between six months and a year, yes. Can we even, the recommendation, as I understand it, of the panel was three months, but they also recommended conditions. They didn't say anything about a reinstatement hearing, but they recommended conditions, which would be continuing treatment, AA meetings, uh, new monitoring agreement, and they wanted all those to last a year. I guess I'm a little confused as to if we were to adopt the three-month suspension, how we put conditions that were more than three months on, on that. How do we know that she's complied until a year is up if, if you put those kind of conditions on it, which seem to be important to the panel? You all are the court, and, and I think you can, you can craft anything that you want. What I, I foresee it would be something like um, somebody that, uh, like Mr. Shepard, who was, who was suspended and he was allowed to petition, and then he was on probation for a, a, another period of time. I think you can maybe do something like that, that, that you would suspend her with a, for a specific period of time, allow for early uh, reinstatement, and then as a condition of the reinstatement, we'd have to serve out the remainder of whatever the period was that, that you had ordered. Um, I, think, I think that is possible. Any more questions? Any further presentation? Uh, no, none at this time. Thank you, Council.
May it please the court, James Brown on half of Megan Harrington. And if I could judge, uh, Ms. Harrington would like to speak for five minutes, so I'll do 10 minutes. That'll be fine. And uh, preliminary, I apologize to the court about not having a coat on, but I sort of got an issue with my left hand. Um, just to get to the heart of the matter, judges, um, Ms. Knoll has uh, discussed the aggravating factors. The main aggravating factor we're dealing with is refusal to acknowledge, acknowledge wrongful uh, nature of the conduct. Typically, uh, that would mean that she has not acknowledged that she has violated the ethical rules. In fact, to the contrary, she has uh, acknowledged since day one she's violated the rules. She had notified Mr. Hazlitt within a week of getting her DUI that um, she very well could have violated the rules. She has a DUI pending, and what steps does she need to take with the disciplinary office to correct what has occurred? Um, for over two and a half years, she has kept in contact with the disciplinary office. Um, in regards to that matter. She has um, made amends with the insurance company. The insurance company has paid out uh, the damage that was uh, occurred to the other person's vehicle. In addition, uh, acknowledging the conduct would be acknowledging that she might have an issue with alcohol. Um, she has had several evaluations, as the court has been made aware. Um, most of those evaluations have shown that she has uh, a substance abuse issue, not a dependency issue at this point. There's a, there's a distinct difference. A substance abuse issue is someone that can gravitate towards a narcotic or uh, alcohol and use it if a certain trigger occur. One could be a family issue. Another could be a problem at work. Someone that has a alcohol or a dependency issue is someone that cannot control the ability to drink or do drugs and continually do it. So there's a distinct difference, and I think the evaluations have... And how does that difference help you? How does that difference help you when you're saying your client could refrain if she chose to, but she chooses not to, versus the dependent person that really doesn't have the power. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing why that helps. It, it's a very valid argument. question. The distinct, the distinct difference between the two is someone that has a dependency issue cannot con control it. In Ms. Harrington's situation, there are triggers that may not be able to help control it. In her situation... Um, after going through all the, the evaluations and substantial treatment, whether it's KLAP, whether it's the, uh, all the sessions she's had, she has learned to address those, those issues. The point, the point I'm getting at is she immediately took steps to rectify those situations. But I think the court needs to be aware there is, there is a difference. Um, one, if you have a dependency issue, you're going to have that the rest of your life. If you've got a, a substance abuse issue, there's triggers you need to learn to, to stop that conduct. In Ms. Harrington's situation, through the evaluations, through the counseling, she did do AA, KLAP. Um, she's learned what triggers those, those uh, may be to, to rectify that. So the, the difference is, is one of dependency versus uh, substance abuse. I know it's, it's hard to distinguish the difference, and I think that's part of the problem. The hearing panel has a hard time distinguishing between the two uh, methods that a lot of people look at, one of dependency and one of uh, substance abuse. So in, in turn, I don't think that the, I think the hearing panel misconstrued when Ms. Harrington stated the, tried to uh, give the difference of abuse versus substance, and that's why they found that she, uh, the aggravating factor is that she's not acknowledging that she has a problem. Well, she's acknowledging that there's a substance abuse issue. What she's not acknowledging at this point is there a dependency issue. Through her counseling, she might be able to, to determine that. So our belief is at this point that she, she has acknowledged the problems that have occurred. She has acknowledged that she has um, done wrong. She readily admitted the violation. So we think the hearing panel was incorrect as far as um, saying that she has not acknowledged the conduct that she, she has done. One of the problems that we have with these cases is trying to look ahead to the respondent practicing law, which is what you're asking us to let her do, uh, and, and trying to assure that the public's going to be protected in the performance of her professional duties. And so as you've got it framed here, how do you think the public is protected uh, in her professional performance of her duties? I think the public is protected in several ways. Um, a, pro a probation plan was um, recommended to the the, uh, the panel. The panel did not uh, adopt that. I know you're answering my. Can I inter interrupt you for a second? Sure. What's the nature of her practice 
and criminal then, law. And then, okay, and now work that through okay. uh, how this is going to work. It's it's criminal law. She had put a probation offered a probation plan. In that probation plan, there's never been an issue with any of her clients or any judges or other attorneys of any substance abuse issue in the courtroom uh, negotiations, anything of that anything of that nature. Any time she's had a, a substance abuse uh, issue has been outside mm -hmm. her legal uh, practice. The probation plan that is we are putting forth will allow several things. One, um, to keep an interlock in her vehicle. Two, she'll have to continue treatment as needed. Um, she will also have Mr. Spees overseeing her trust account and her uh, files. Um, but the main focus of the probation plan is going to be around addressing her substance uh, issues and ensuring uh, for the court's purposes that there won't be any issues in the courtroom of alcohol, drugs, or anything of that nature. There never has been, but it, it is true that the court does need to make sure that if someone does have a substance abuse issue, that they are able to practice law and not have a problem inside the courtroom. So to answer your question, I think the probation plan would rectify your concern as far as whether or not Ms. Harrington would have any problems in the courtroom and will not able to protect uh, the citizens of the state of Kansas. So it's your position her substance abuse problem has not had has had no impact whatsoever <coughs> on her professional life. Is that right? I think that, no, I think that it has had an impact on her professional life. It's very embarrassing to have to walk into her, her primary place of practice in Johnson County after going in front of a judge and plead guilty to DUI. That is, that is embarrassing. It's also embarrassing to have to tell all of her colleagues she's been convicted of DUI. But as far as her practice, <coughs> meaning being in court, writing motions, that has never been an issue with any substance abuse problems. Oh, I just want to make sure that we weren't just talking about problems in the courtroom. There have been no problems whatsoever with her clients other than her admission to them that I've got a substance abuse problem. Is that right? Correct. She's never had an issue, issue with any judges or, or their attorneys with any problems with substance abuse issues. Or her clients. To my knowledge, no. <clears throat> There's never been uh, a client complaint or anything of that nature, no. The other issues that we'd like to bring well, up. One more question. Yes. I, I, going back to that paragraph on refusal to acknowledge the wrongful conduct, I think a big part of that I, we're not really talking about was what the panel perceived as a refusal to acknowledge uh, the wrongfulness of the cocaine ingestion and, and sort of the effort to write that off as recreational use and and no real acceptance of responsibility. That was as much a part of that finding, I think, as anything else. How does how does the plan that you have address the, the concern, uh, the lack of recognition of, of that issue? I don't think that Ms. Harrington had a, had a lack of um, understanding or lack of acknowledgement of the cocaine use. I think what Ms. Harrington was trying to do, <coughs> excuse me, was acknowledged that it was a recreational issue. While no one should have a rec recreational issue with cocaine, Ms. Harrington did. What she was trying to, to portray to the panel was is that she had a certain group of friends that she was with, and it was readily available, and, and she used it. She acknowledged it was wrong at with the panel. I think the panel's perception was uh, is that anybody that would use cocaine, it's not just a recreational issue. Well, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't think that complies with the testimony that I read and, and the findings of what the, what the panel said. They heard her testimony, as Ms. Knoll said, and they were very concerned about her casual response to that particular area of questioning, and they noted that. Um, and I think, I guess I'm, I'm hearing you disagree with the panel, but not really dealing with what the panel found, assuming we take that to be an accurate finding, finding yeah, I, that we I, accept. I think that... Um, Rather than just disagreeing with it, I guess I'd like to hear how you think her plan the probation accommodates plan? that or the pro probation deals plan, with that. The probation plan deals with it in such a way that it's the same thing with doing the UAs. <coughs> Um, the, the court will know, so the administrator will know if she has a dirty A, whether it's been cocaine ingestion or anything else of that nature. That includes all illegal substances. So the probation plan that's, that, that has been in place, that Ms. Harrington's been following, requires the UAs, so we'll know whether or not she has um, ingested cocaine. 
has had alcohol, something of that nature. I'm not asking about after the fact uh, UA. I'm asking about how you deal with, with what the panel found was uh, an attitude, essentially, of, of not really recognizing not only the illegality of it, but how it might impact her, her conduct, her professional practice. I think it goes back to the difference between a substance abuse and a dependency issue. I think the hearing panel had a hard time distinguishing between the two. I think it's the same thing with the cocaine issue. At no, at no time uh, do I believe that Ms. Harrington was... Well, co cocaine is illegal. Yes. The use of cocaine is illegal. We're not talking about alcohol now. They were talking about the Ill illegality of it. Correct. And, and the and refusal to recognize that in their mind. I don't think you can compare these two things. And I, I understand that. I think that the, the cocaine use, I, I don't think Ms. Harrington will get up here and, and state that it's okay to do cocaine, cocaine. I think everybody can agree that it is illegal to do cocaine. And I think doing cocaine is, is incorrect. I think the hearing panel is correct in making that assumption and statement that it, it is wrong to do cocaine. Um, I think the broader picture with Ms. Harrington is that there's some issues going on that she's trying to address. It has been very difficult for Ms. Harrington to come to terms with uh, going from a DOI to ingesting cocaine, alcohol, and, and addressing all those issues. And the probationary plan allows for her to be able to do that while still practicing law and to protect the citizens of, of Kansas. Moving to the probation plan, I've discussed, discussed a little bit. Um, Ms. Harrington filed the affidavit showing that she's been in compliance with the probation plan that she has put forth. Um, in the affidavit, she had mentioned <coughs> several documents. One would be a letter from Mr. Spees, um, who is overseeing her probationary plan. He has written a letter uh, verifying that she's in compliance and what she has done. Second documents from pro Professional Treatment Services, that document is an evaluation that was completed and the recommendations that she is to follow. There are two other documents of her AA uh, attendance that I think are very important. The third is from, from KLAP um, stating that she is currently enrolled in KLAP um, and will be continuing KLAP uh, during the pendency of, of what's going on. What I request from the court, I know Ms. Knowles has mentioned it, is the court permit uh, me to go ahead and file these documents and supplement for the court so they can review this in conjunction with the probation plan. And I think I'll give the remainder of my time to Ms. Harrington. Counsel, before you go, um, what's your understanding of the nature of Mr. Spee's practice? Uh, Mr. Spee's practice is uh, predominantly criminal law. And I noticed in going through um, the <coughs> file, when you filed a motion for an extension of time on your brief, that in the cases that you listed that the respondent was engaged in. One of those was a 1983 civil case, which is, so what per, I mean, what percentage of the respondent's practice would drift over into civil litigation? I would say almost none. I think that case is an exception okay. that she had, had met someone that really needed help, so she had offered to help. Okay. But knowing Ms. Harrington for a long time, her practice has always been uh, criminal. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court. First, as both an officer of the court and as an individual, I would like to apologize to uh, Mr. Fanez, which is the individual that I struck with my vehicle, uh, this court and the legal profession for my actions on April 18th, 2009. Although my conduct was not directly related to my practice of law, I realize that it reflects poorly on the bar, and I sincerely regret bringing dishonor to this profession. Hardly a day goes by that I do not still think about the car accident. I am grateful every day that I do not cause serious injury. I can stand here today and honestly tell you that no one takes what happened more seriously than I do. I am not the same person that I was on April 18th, 2009. I made several horrible decisions that night, none of which I will ever repeat. While I fully admit my guilt in driving under the influence and causing an accident, I do want to inform this court that I did not intentionally obstruct justice that night. My repeated assertions to the officer at the scene were the result of my confusion surrounding the accident. In determining the appropriate discipline in my case, I would ask this court to please consider the consequences I have dealt with and the actions I have taken since the accident. 
Almost two years ago exactly, I entered the Johnson County Adult Detention Center and served 45 days in jail, followed by 60 days on house arrest. I remain on probation at this time. I continue to see a probation officer, I take urinalysis tests, and I have an ignition interlock device in my vehicle, which I plan on keeping in my vehicle past the two-year uh, date that was provided in my sentencing. Almost immediately after the accident, I began outpatient substance abuse treatment, which I continued for one full year. I also signed a one-year monitoring agreement with the Kansas Lawyers Assistance Program, which required weekly AA attendance. I successfully completed both of those. At the recommendation of the hearing panel, I recently signed a second one-year monitoring agreement with the Kansas Lawyers Assistance Program, and I have resumed weekly AA attendance. The treatment I completed helped me recognize my issues as a social binge drinker and how I allowed myself to get to the point that I did on April 18, 2009. It also has provided me with the tools to ensure that it will never happen again. The biggest change that has occurred since that time is I simply grew up. I have no desire to return to the lifestyle where binge drinking was acceptable. I know that I'm a good attorney. I enjoy what I do and there are days where I actually feel like I'm making a difference in someone's life. I strongly desire the opportunity to continue to do so. While my actions on April 18, 2009 reflected poorly on the profession, as a whole, I believe I have contributed to it in a positive manner. I recently received an email from a client who told me that while lawyers often get a bad rep, I was one of the good ones who truly cared about her clients, and I do, and I hope I get the chance to continue to practice on probation. Thank you. I'm uh, open to answer any questions that you might have. Counsel, are you a sole practitioner? Yes, I am. And what impact on your practice would any length of a suspension have? Obviously, it would be very difficult. Um, I am lucky. Uh, small portion of my practice is uh, research and motion writing for other attorneys, so I believe I could continue to do that. But otherwise, um, it would be quite financially devastating. I primarily do criminal defense work. I do a lot of juvenile work out in the county, Johnson County, particularly, and uh, obviously, I would not be able to take any of those cases. Are those uh, what percentage of your practice would be appointment of criminal or juvenile cases? Well, I was on the criminal appointment list, and I removed myself as soon as I was charged in this case, and I never request to be put back on uh, the misdemeanor list there. The juvenile appointments, I probably receive um, maybe three cases every three months or so, and those can drag out for a couple of months. But most of your practice would be with private clients? Private clients? Private clients, private clients? Adults, cr criminal defense. Private, private clients? Private clients, yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, they're almost all retained. All right. Any questions of counsel? Any further presentation? No, I will inform the court. I know there was some discussion about um, it's not fully recognizing my problem or my hesitancy with AA. And I struggled along, as I think some of your questions, with uh, understanding the difference between abuse and dependency. And uh, I received a substance abuse evaluation at the beginning of, um, I guess, right after the accident. And then about uh, probably a year later, I received an updated evaluation, and both of those classified me as substance abuse. Um, I went to AA during the year that I was in the KLAP program, uh, and I struggled with AA because I was a binge, I'm a binge drinker, or was a binge drinker. Uh, I wasn't someone who drank in the morning or daily drink, and that's what the majority of AA was, and I had a difficult time relating uh, to what was going on in those meetings as someone who did not drink on a daily basis. Uh, I felt like I had received enough treatment. I did a lot of self-education. I read a lot of things on my own and many books about the subject. However, after the panel hearing, I'm very upset to hear that they thought my testimony was casual, that I wasn't sincerely um, remorseful for what happened because I am, and I certainly did not want uh, my testimony to be taken that way. And so I did receive a new evaluation um, that did indicate that there was a moderate possibility of having a problem in the future. And that was explained to me when I spoke with that evaluator that um, the new, I guess, paradigm of addiction is binge drinking and that people commonly have that idea that it needs to be a daily drink, which is what I thought, and that it's shifting now toward people who binge drink and you could go several months or a year without a problem, but if that tendency is there, that's what you need to be on the lookout for. And so that's how it's been explained to me, and it makes a lot more sense to me with that. And that's how I've started this new treatment, is uh, with that information in mind. Any further questions? 
Thank you. Thank you. You'd reserve four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Chief. One of the difficulties <clears throat> that the panel faced was that Ms. Harrington didn't bring any of her treatment professionals to the hearing to answer their questions about the differences. Um, <clears throat> the transcript will reflect, I actually called Ann McDonald from Caleb and had her there at my request and um, Ms. Harrington declined to ask her any questions even about her participation with the program. To go back to what Justice Files was asking about the plural singular with professionals, Exhibit E as an elephant in the record is the assessment services, the ASAP eval, um, and the Barry T. Reed's name on it is on, on it as a director, and that indicates that she is a substance abuser. Then there is a letter from challenges dated January 12th of 2011, and that was by Linda Anderson Petty, who she was actually attending uh, individual therapy, and that's where um, the counselor wrote that she, although she does not believe she's an alcoholic, she attended some AA meetings and has remained abstinent. Um, the new information that you're going to receive, the evaluation from the uh, professional uh, services over in Lawrence, if the court could look at page five, specifically um, paradigms three and four. Um, three is emotional and cognitive conditions, and it talks about her addictive behaviors and how this writer particularly believes that she has actually shifted addiction from alcohol to stress, to working out and, and actually working hard um, and exercise. And dimension four, which is the readiness to change the writer writes, um, that she has made huge strides in her life and has gained from her therapy. This writer believes that she's still in a contemplation stage of the stage of change model due to her ambivalence about her having an addictive disorder as well as her willingness to participate in a 12-step program. And he indicates that there's a moderate potential for future problems. And then he goes on to recommend that um, she immerse herself in a 12-step program, that she could benefit from some individual counseling and some, some other things, and suggested that she get uh, hooked back up with Kayla. That was in March. Um, as she just told you, she was just recently reengaged with with KLAP. Um, and the AA logs that she will turn into you show that she started going back into June. And the final hearing report asks that she immediately go uh, start doing all, all of these things. So it would be my suggestion to this court that um, waiting six or so months is not immediacy, especially when you're dealing with somebody that has this type of an addiction. Um, the final thing, we did not have an update from the PO officer. I honestly have no reason to believe that she is not following her compliance with her probation because it, that would... Uh, come to fruition in some sort of motion to revoke. Um, and Mr. Spees, uh, there was a question about him. He is perfectly acceptable as, as a practice supervisor. He has done some work with our office previously, and I have great confidence in, in his abilities. Um, and I believe that's all. I, did, again, did, did I understand you to say that shifting addiction or shifting habits is a bad thing? Uh, what was that? Uh, that she has shifted from drinking or binge drinking to working out or something? Is, is that? Okay, it says, um, Ma Megan, from this writer's view, does have an addictive disorder. Addic addictive disorders can include both chemical and behavioral addictions. Megan's addictive symptoms began when she was young and were first presented, and I'll let you all read the rest. Yeah, that, that's fine. I just, that's, yeah, okay. It says that since she's chemically free, she is now cross-addicted to extreme work, exercise, and rigid eating. Okay. Anything further, counsel? I do not. All right. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you all for your arguments this morning and this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement. It's time the court is in recess until 9 o'clock tomorrow morning.